AMD's Ryzen 7 9800X3D is touted as one of the best out-of-the-box gaming CPUs you can buy. I tested it late last year, and I can absolutely vouch for that. It's an impeccable performer. However, one thing that did stood out to me was the surprisingly high temps and power draw, even in typical gaming workloads. And I'm not alone in this. A quick search on Reddit or even YouTube will show you tons of users reporting temps upwards of 70 or even 80 degrees Celsius during gaming which frankly is a bit too much for my liking, and that's with a 360 AIO. In fact, during some of the earlier testing with the CPU, I found that it actually ran hotter than my 4900K despite using less power. So in this video, what I'm going to be showing you guys is how you can cut down those temps and power draw without sacrificing the excellent performance that this chip has to offer. Let's get into it. Hey, if you enjoy content like this, drop a like, make sure to subscribe, and smash that bell so you never miss another video. Hey, what is going on guys? Danny here. Welcome back to the channel and I hope you've all been doing well. Today we're going to be taking a look at some very important testing that I've done with my Ryzen 7 9800X 3D along with some very eye-opening results. And this isn't just going to benefit those who have a 9800X 3D, but if you have any Ryzen CPU for that matter, then stick around, especially if you're someone who's looking to reduce your CPU's temperatures and power draw without sacrificing any noticeable performance. The 9800X 3D is a a great gaming CPU. We all know that. I tested the CPU in a wide variety of games and compared it against competing parts like the Intel Core i9-14900K and the Ultra 9 285K. However, if there was one thing I noticed, it was that this chip ran pretty hot, even compared to those Intel processors I was testing it against, which have more cores and actually drew more power under the same load. And you can go on Google and do a quick search. You'll find many places, forum threads on Reddit, and places like YouTube where users are reporting high temperatures with this chip during a gaming workload with some users reporting temps upwards of 80 degrees Celsius, which is, you know, quite frankly, during a gaming workload, that is much higher than where I'd like to see my CPUs run at. Take a look at the side-by-side -side footage of Cyberpunk 2077 from that video I made late last year, and what you'll see is that the 9800X 3D, despite drawing considerably less power than my 14900K, still ran slightly hotter. And before any anyone asks, no, this is not an issue with cooler installation or thermal paste application. These Ryzen chips, and particularly the ones with 3D vCache stacked with a CCD, just create a higher thermally dense package, hence you see these high temps because there's more heat concentrated into one area. On top of that, AMD limits the voltage to protect the fragile vCache layers, which means boosting relies more heavily on power management and thermal headroom. So when the CPU runs hot, it can potentially throttle more quickly. That's why these chips appear to be so aggressive thermally out of the box, because AMD is trying to squeeze out as much performance as they can while staying within the limits of that 3D stacked architecture. Hence, you saw Ryzen CPUs since the 7000 series immediately hit like 95C under load, even with an AIO installed because according to AMD, they're just maxing out the thermal headroom that the CPU has in order to achieve maximum boost. Now, since then, I've always said that I wasn't comfortable with running my chip that hot for such a prolonged period of time because that's just not healthy for the silicon either way you look at it. And when you have a dense 3D cache CPU, that can be more prone to failure. In fact, there's been reports of 9800X3Ds dying, and I know there were issues in particular with ASRock boards and high voltage, which they made a public statement about, but I've also seen reports of people using Gigabyte and ASUS boards waking up one day and finding their 9800X3D no longer uh, is booting up. Interestingly, I was talking to some reps at a couple of Canada computer locations nearby, and they actually mentioned that they have been dealing with and seeing a higher than usual number of returns or RMAs for their 9800X3D chips because the user reported that it just suddenly died on them or in some instances they have even seen burn marks on the socket or on the back of the CPU itself. And the results that I'm going to be showing you guys, you're going to find out that out of the box or from the factory, AMD is pushing this chip much harder than it actually has to run at. And I believe there's a good chance 
this may have been contributing to all those reports that we're seeing from users online where they're reporting high temperatures, high voltages, and, you know, high power draw, and suddenly finding that their 9800 X3D chips have died. So exactly what's going on here? You're going to want to pay close attention here. AMT has configured the 9800X3D with fairly aggressive precision boost power limits right out of the box. Now don't confuse precision boost with precision boost overdrive, also known as PBO. We'll get to PBO in a moment. These are the values that determine how much power the CPU is allowed to pull, and they directly impact temperatures, clock behavior, and ultimately the longevity of the chip. They essentially define the power and thermal characteristics or the behavior of this chip. For the 9800X3D, the stock limits are set to PPT or package power tracking at 162 watts, TDC, which stands for thermal design current at 120 amps, EDC, electrical design current at 180 amps. These aren't exactly conservative numbers either, especially for an 8-core chip. And when you combine that with the thermally dense nature of 3D vCache and a single CCD layout, it's no surprise that the chips are reported to be running pretty hot under a sustained gaming or productivity workload. What's more surprising is despite having the room to reduce these limits, AMD seems to be pushing them pretty close to the edge, probably in an effort to maintain top tier gaming performance or just out of the box performance in general, like I said earlier. When I visited this topic a few years ago with the 5800X, I learned that the stock limits that AMD had set for that chip, so that was Zen 3, uh, they had set PPT at 142 watts, TDC at 95 amps, and EDC at 140 amps, and that chip was also reported to be running pretty hot for an 8-core. So comparing that to Zen 5's limits, that's a pretty significant increase, but I'll be showing you guys shortly there is a better way to tune the CPU for much cooler operation without losing any performance. So before we get into any sort of tweaking at all, let's take a look at how the 9800X3D performs in its stock configuration. And to list out some quick specs, I'm gonna be testing on my MSI X870 Tomahawk motherboard with the latest BIOS installed, with the MSI E360 AIO cooler, with its fans normalized to 1300 RPM, and the pump running at 3200 RPM, paired with 32 gigabytes of 6200 CL28 DDR5 memory, and an RTX 4090. Full specs will be in the video description as well. I ran a 30 minute stress test in Cinebench R23 to stimulate a sustained heavy workload. Right from the start of the test, the CPU's package temp rose all the way to 90 degrees Celsius and plateaued at around 91C average, which is quite hot. During this test, the CPU averaged 149 watts and peaked at 152 watts, with PPT being the same, our EDC average was at 98 amps with a peak of around 109 amps. And TDC was at 94 amps with a peak of 96 amps, so we're nowhere close to those stock current limits as we're primarily power and thermal throttled. But 91C under this kind of workload is just too hot, and my 4900K under the same condition operates at around 75 to 80C while pulling about 100 watts more. Now during gaming, if you recall from that previous 40 game benchmark video I did, my 9800X3D was running hotter than my 4900K and 285K despite pulling considerably less power. And I've now updated my benchmark suite to include The Last of Us 2, which I find is just as CPU intensive as the first game's port. Here you can see footage of my 9800X3D running with stock limits, no no other tuning, and during the beginning of the test, you can see that CPU is around 60 degrees Celsius and near the end of the run, it rises up to around 67C with the power usage around 90 to 100 watts. Now, I don't want to sound like some elitist or someone who's extremely nitpicking here because the stats that you guys just saw from that run would be no way detrimental to the CPU uh, or that its performance. They're totally fine, but if there is a way to drastically lower both temperatures and power usage without really sacrificing any FPS at all, then why wouldn't you want to do that? Espe especially if you're someone who's using a more lower end cooler or you're finding yourself using a more thermal constrained case like an ITX case for example. 
So since you've seen how the chip behaves out of the box, let's explore what happens when you start to dial things in. What you're seeing here is the UEFI on the MSI X870 Tomahawk and what we're going to do is go into the Advanced CPU Configuration menu and go into Precision Boost Overdrives menu. I've had it set to Disabled for the stock testing, but by default most boards have it on Auto which mainly makes the chip adhere to stock values, so it's basically the same thing. We're going to enable the Advanced option and you'll see PBO Limits. Set that to manual and then you'll see three fields for PPT, TDC, and EDC limits. Now you can set these to whatever you want, but for my chip, in order to power limit it, I had set it to 115 PPT, 90C TDC, and 105 EDC. Now you don't have to copy my exact values, you can go even lower than I did, it's totally up to you. Do some trial and error and find the sweet spot for your chip. Again, this will all come down to silicon lottery. Then the last thing you want to do is go into the curve optimizers menu, set it to all core and then set the sign to negative and then set the value to 25. Now I have seen a lot of people online say that they can do negative 35 or some go as far as minus 40. I find that pretty hard to believe that they're 100% stable, but in any case, I recommend thoroughly stress testing your chip to ensure it's actually stable. For my chip, I found negative 25 was stable for all scenarios. Then that's pretty much it. You don't have to do anything else. You can save and exit. You'll see your PC restart and then you might it might take a little while for you to get back into windows but after that everything should be applied and you'll see your settings all there the first set of results i wanted to show you guys were from cinebench r23 and i've included my overclock configuration which basically sets the pbl limits to motherboard which are pretty high negative 25 curve on the optimizer and then plus 200 megahertz offset for the frequency boost stock out of the box the 9800x 3d scores 23312 with a single core score of 2105. When the 9800X 3D is overclocked, we gain about a 4% increase on our multi-core score and also the single core score as well. But the, with our power limit tune, we see our multi-core score drop a mere 2% while our single core stays basically the same. As you guys can see, performance in a heavy multi-threaded workload hardly changes, but that's not even the best part. When we take a look at thermals, we can see that the 9800X 3D averaged around 68C for the package temperature during this workload with the power limit applied, whereas with the stock configuration, we were looking at around 91C. And what's funny is that our overclock configuration actually ran slightly cooler as well. That's a pretty significant delta in temps for a mere 2% loss in multi-core performance. I will gladly take that any day of the week, and hey, considering it's summertime, I'm sure most of you would as well. When we take a look at our power figures, we see a drop of around 40 watts on average, and also a pretty steep drop in current as well. Next, we'll take a look at gaming, and the first game I wanted to show you guys is The Last of Us 2. As I showed you earlier, it's a pretty CPU-intensive and multi-threaded game. As you guys can see, that performance is pretty similar across the board. Our overclock doesn't really net as much performance, but power and temps don't change at all. However, with our power limited configuration, you can see it's providing the same level of performance as the other two, but power consumption has dropped considerably lower, which also leads to much lower temps during the run. This is great to see because it shows you just how much headroom this chip has when it comes to finding a balance between performance and power. If you can reduce the limits, that much without making any sort of impact on your gaming performance, its FPS or the lows, then that's what I would recommend you to do if you're already satisfied with the stock performance. Here's what's also very interesting to see. So during a 30 minute gameplay session of Last of Us 2, I decided to also review the core vids. These are the requested voltage levels that each CPU core is asking the motherboard's voltage regulator to supply during operation. And you'll notice that for all the cores, they're hovering around 1.23 to 1.25 volts, which isn't anything to be really concerned about. AMD hasn't officially confirmed what the max safe voltage is for the 9000 series or these X3D CPUs, but many people within the overclocking and tweaking community say that up to 1.3 volts is fine. The thing with voltage is that the lower you can have it while under operation, the better it is for the longevity of your chip. So with the power limit applied, we see that from the reported core vids, we're looking at around 1.13 volts, which is a basically a 0.1 volt reduction, and that's a very significant decrease, and yet we lost no performance at all. 
I then went back and also reviewed the Corvid data during our Cinebench R23 testing, and I found that, under stock conditions, the 9800X3D scores were requesting around 1.24 to 1.25 volts, and when we had power-tuned our 9800X3D, the core vids were reporting around 1.1 volts, which is absolutely huge. So if you're someone who's also trying to reduce core voltage during a heavy operation as much as possible, then going this route is what I would suggest because it's an easier method rather than faffoing around with a manually dialed in voltage value. Let's move on and take a look at another game, and this is Kingdom Come Deliverance 2, an open world game, and I'm testing in the city of Kuttenberg, which also has a lot of NPCs. What you'll see is that performance between our stock config and our power tune config is basically identical. The overclock configuration is faster, but not by a huge noticeable margin. But still, it's nice to see that you, if you want to overclock and, you know, really squeeze out as much performance as you want, then you're not actually going to be seeing a dramatic increase in power draw or temps. Nonetheless, if you're satisfied with the stock gaming performance, then going with the power tune route is better since we see like a 15C lower reduction in temps and 20 watts lower power consumption. And I also want to show you guys some footage from Cyberpunk 2077 in Dogtown or Phantom Liberty. And even though this game is nearly five years old, it's still getting lots of updates and people clearly like playing it. And hey, it's heavily multi-threaded. What we see is with our power tune configuration, it's providing us with the same performance as stock while, again, pulling like 20 watts lower power and running like 12C cooler. I also did benchmarks of three more titles, and we'll just go over them quickly with these charts as they show the same story. Spider-Man 2, there was like a 3 FPS drop compared to stock with the power limit applied, basically within margin of error and nothing that the user would actually notice. Monster Hunter Wilds, which showed the same thing, hardly any difference between stock and the power limited configuration, and then Call of Duty Black Ops 6, which was a tie. All games also showed pretty significant reduction in temps and power usage. Now do keep in mind, I don't have a huge sample size of CPUs here, this is the only 9800X 3D chip that I have on hand, but those margins that we're seeing are absolutely huge, and I have no doubt that, you know, if there were others out there who applied the same or similar power limits to their chip, they would be seeing similar results. And they can do this to help really control those temps and bring power usage down, especially if for someone who's using a lower end cooler, you're using air cooling and or you're using an ITX case where higher thermals can be more prevalent. Because I saw the same exact type of results back when I did this same testing with the 5800X and also the 5900X I had on hand. It confirms what I was telling you guys all at the start of the video, that AMD has configured this chip to run a lot more power hungry than it really has to, and they probably can be more conservative because the limits I applied were actually quite aggressive compared to what comes configured out of the box. So to wrap this all up, what we've learned is that the Ryzen 9800X 3D, while it's a phenomenal gaming CPU out of the box, it is definitely being pushed harder than it really has to be by AMD, you know, in its stock configuration. It's why you'll come across so many threads and posts online of users reporting high temperatures or power draw on their chips. But the good news is that with a little bit of tuning, dropping those PBO limits and dialing in a modest curve optimizer, you can drastically cut down on power draw and temps while barely losing any performance, if at all. Your system will end up running cooler and quieter, and especially if you're running a smaller case, like I said, a ITX case, or you're using air cooling. And this will also improve the lifespan of your chip. So I think it's, you know, 100% worth doing. But in the meantime, I hope this helped you guys out. I hope you all learned something from this video. That's really all I have to share for now. And um, that's going to wrap it up for this one. We'll touch base in the next video. If you guys found this video to be informative and entertaining, then leave a like. Let me know your thoughts and comments down below. Be sure to check out the video description for cool links and ways to support the channel, such as using my Amazon affiliate link. And if you're interested in seeing more content like this, then consider subscribing, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for watching, take care and I'll see you in the next one.